so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about a project we've been working on at Red Hat as part of the automotive program. And that's, that has to do with uh, managing services across uh, different nodes. Uh, so a few, a few things to know. Uh, I'm Pierre Chimon at Pingu. Uh, this is Michael, that I'll let introduce himself. Thanks. Uh, yeah, nothing more to add. We have a logo, so the Cow team is the container on wheels teams. You can see the logo on the, t on, the, on the top right, and because we have a logo, we have stickers. So if you have questions at the end, we'll hand out stickers. And you see stick around, we may still give you stickers if you want them. Uh, so without further ado, what are we going to be talking about here? Uh, I'm going to be giving you a little bit of the introduction of the setting up the context of the challenges for running the, for the automotive industries and what led us to, uh, you know, to enter that uh, multi-node service controller. The, the challenges of the automotive industries are multi-facet. Uh, one of the facets that has to do with this is it's a very, very competitive landscape. There are many automotive you know, car manufacturers around the world and some of them are very old. If you take Pedro, Pedro was founded in 1810 before the first car was even created. Peugeot was originally a kitchen uh, appliance company. They were building uh, ki kitchen tools, uh, which is also why you can still find in some places a uh, Peugeot branded salt and paper uh, grinder. Uh, but then, you know, at the end of the, uh, the end of the century, they started working on their first car in 1889. And Peugeot is worth about $50 billion today. Uh, if you look at General Motors, which is the second car manufacturer worldwide, uh, it was founded in, 18, on, in 1908, it's 47 billion. So if we look at the, the you know, number two, number two, three, and four from the bottom here, uh, we have Ford, which is also a pretty famous and you know, pretty old uh, automotive company that we all know about from our history books and economic classes about the way Ford has industrialized the production of automotive. They're all about the same weight when we look at market capitalization. Then we have Toyota. Toyota is today the first car manufacturer in the world. In the number of cars produced per year, Toyota leads the leads. And it was created in 1937. Toyota is worth about four times as much as the previous three. <coughs> but then we have, we have the young king around the block, the young, the young kid around the block, that's Tesla. Tesla is barely 20 years old. It's not even legal to drink in the US yet. And yet it waits about nearly you know, 12 times as much as Ford that was created 100 years before. So Tesla is doing something in the automotive industry that is, you know, that is changing the landscape of things. That is, it's building something that the market is believing in. And that is a challenge for the old automotive companies because they suddenly realize that you know, there is a kid on the block that just created, that just appeared, and it's already weighing 10 times as much as I do. And I've been there for a long time. I'm an old timer. So that's a, that's, a, that's a challenge. That's something they need to address. What does Tesla do that we are not and that makes them at this place here? Uh, so they, that's something they need to look into. Something else that has changed over the last few years was COVID-19. And as much as we like that this is over, the, the, the ripples of that, uh, of that pandemic are still around there. And one of the side effects was the ship shortage. And we're still recovering from that. Uh, I don't have a sources for that, but I had heard at some point that during the pandemic, car manufacturers would have been able to sell twice as many cars as they did, except they couldn't produce them. They had customers, they had, you know, they are salesmen, they are the sales, they are the customers, they just couldn't produce the product just because of the shit shortage. So that leads to some decision that needs to be made. Something else that has changed to, do to the industry is the user expectations. We no longer see, we no longer have the same relationship that we have with our IT systems as we used to, and one of the reasons is simply our smartphones. You update your smartphones. Apple is well known to be able to update the operating systems over the lifetime of the hardware. Samsung has, has announced a few years ago that they are now supporting the hardware for five years. There is an expectation about supportability. There is an expectation about life cycle for our hardware that has changed. We, we want updates. We want features. We are we expecting that. And when you get into a car and you realize a brand new car has information in it that is maybe older than the brand new car that has been bought before, 
simply because car number two was actually started before the program for car number two was started before the program for car number one, something's wrong. I actually witnessed this myself. I, uh, you know, a friend of mine bought a, a, a fairly, uh, a fairly dec decent recent car, brand new, and the GPS data was older than the car which I had bought new a few years before. It's just that the, car, the model year of the car that he bought was older than the model year of the car that I bought, even though it was newer outside of the factory. So our user expectations have changed. Something else that the automotive industry is looking at is this diversification of revenue. Just being able, when you sell a car, you have no guarantee, you know, you sell it, you have, one, you have income for one time, but how can we make that income persist over time? How can I make more money from the single car? And this, have, there are a few ways that the, the industry is looking into all of these problems. One of them is, okay, we have a ship shortage, so we need to revise how we are building our cars. We need to revise what the onboard uh, computing systems look like. So this is a slide from an XP, which I found in one of the publications, which goes to what we currently have today. It's called domain vehicle architecture, domain architecture, where you have a lot of small distinct compute units across the car. Like a modern car can have nearly about 100 different computing units. When you're looking for, when you have a shortage of ships, you can understand that building different 100 distinct compute units in a car is a problem. So what they're looking into is more what they call zonal architecture. And the idea behind that is that you have less distinct ECUs that are very dedicated to something specific and more bigger ECUs that are, that are able of handling multiple of these uh, discrete ECUs tasks. So you have less hardware, but bigger hardware, more, more um, powerful hardware, but also hardware that can potentially evolve over time. So hardware that is no longer designed to be exactly doing this one task, but it is produced with a design that it may be doing something else in the future. So the architecture of the, of the vehicles are being worked on. But the hardware is only a part of the story. The software becomes the other part of the story. We need to, we, there is this concept called software-defined vehicle, and the idea is that by changing the software in the car, we are able to change the experience of the driver in the car. We are able to make the car evolve during its lifetime, but we're also able to customize it to the user's desires and wishes and uh, needs. So software-defined vehicle, you know, revising the architecture, revising the hardware is part one. Revising the software, how do we approach software in the car is part two. And then, so what's the vision? The vision ends up to be something that is very, very similar to what we have on our smartphones. We want to be able to do software updates, and we want to be able to do that over the air, just like you update your Android phone or your iOS phone just by plugging it to the Wi-Fi. You want to be able to, uh, to update the hardware, while in a car, it's still going to be, you know, take the car to the car dealer and potentially get a new, uh, new compute unit that is more powerful. Uh, just like you go to your phone store and change your phone. You want to be able to have applications, being able to install these applications dynamically. This application may give you new capabilities, new features. Uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at Tesla, uh, a few years ago, there was an update to Tesla that has increased the, cap the actual engine, ho the, 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 well, the that has increased the horsepowers of the engines. Basically, you bought the car, it was 150 horsepowers, you update the software, your car is 155 horsepowers. Simply because they were able to optimize the way the software was able to get, you know, the, uh, working with the engine. And just by changing the software, they actually changed the physical capabilities of the car. Suddenly the car is going faster, suddenly the car is more powerful. Uh, you know, new features, new capabilities can be also something fun. So, you know, like you've missed on paying your car, so uh, don't, don't pay on this month, so the car is going to drive itself to the garage. It's like, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Customization and building an experience, that's what is more interesting. It's like, you know, when you, you're able to start to customize the experience of the driver based on the driver's preferences, <laughs> which means you can build habits. And when the, con when the time comes to change your car, you're actually going to try to find these habits that you've built in your car, and therefore you try to build fidelity to a certain brand. So how do we get there? I've already mentioned, we simplify the hardware. 
we also want to standardize, and that's a place where the Red Hat and Vehicle OS becomes interesting. It's a, Red Hat has been always very strong about standards and open standards in particular. So having an operating system that relies on these standards or actually help developing on top of it. And then we spoke about you know, customization, applications. So we spoke about container, basically. We want containers for process isolation. That's been covered a little bit this morning about being able to ensure that processes do not interact with each other when they should not, they, sh they don't impact one another. Container also means that they have a, a specific lifecycle management, which we're used to, so we can install, we can update, we can remove containers. And let's be honest, container is, is the de facto you know, standards now in our industry, which means you know, talent acquisition for car manufacturer become easier if they don't have, to, they have to learn the specificities of an automotive product, but they don't have to relearn the entire ecosystems around it. When we speak about containers, we want to speak about, with an S, then we want to speak about orchestrations as well. And today, when we speak about container orchestrations, we're practically speaking about Kubernetes. So I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. Do we want Kubernetes in a car? And I already see someone say, don't spoil it. <laughs> Leave the answer to some to other people. <laughs> so. The answer is, okay, I'm going to spot it. We don't want Kubernetes in the car, and there are a few reasons for that. One of them is Kubernetes is built around the concept of eventual consistency, which means there is no guarantee when a change will be applied, but there is also no guarantee of the order in which changes are going to be applied. Uh, the extreme example that we always take, but it's, it's technically not a good example, but it's, uh, it's always helped to understand, is like, you know, you don't want to be driving a car that will say that you press, a, you press the brake pedal and then suddenly, eventually your car will break. That is not an experience you want to do. It's a bad example because we're not actually going to be involved in the brake systems, uh, but it, it, gives the, it gives the idea. You don't want, you don't want a car that, ch that is working towards a state. You want to be either in state A or in state B. You don't want to be somewhere along the journey you don't know exactly where. Another something else is that Kubernetes is fairly heavyweight. Kubernetes and its derivative have been built around the container runtime that at that time was not able to give a status to, to signify when something had changed. So Kubernetes have been built around the, the idea of uh, I can't get the information so I need to go and get it. You can't give it to me so I'm going, I'm going to get it so it's always asking like, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? At some point it takes resources. Uh, there was a, a consortium uh, that did some investigation on that and on Raspberry Pi Granted, it's a fairly low device, but you know, 15 to 20% of their system resources were used by Kubernetes just doing nothing. Just Kubernetes being there and poking the container runtime asking, are you done yet, are you done yet, are you done yet? Kubernetes is, a, is meant for distributed system. It's, meant, it's great for cloud environment. It's, meant, it's great for worldwide distributed system. But that also makes it a very complex system, and a lot of that complexity is not needed in a car. Things like end demand scaling, scaling out. You know, you, I'm suddenly running, it's Black Friday in the US, my store has a lot of input suddenly for, for the sales. Uh, you know, being able to scale out to a public cloud so that I can get more resources, so that I can accommodate to this sudden influx of, the, of data makes sense. But in a car, you're not going to have that sudden influx of data. The amount of data that you get from the review camera is going to be the, always, always going to be the same thing. So, that scaling out simply is not needed in a car. A lot of that complexity that makes Kubernetes great in a number of environments, especially the cloud environment, just is not applicable in a car. Another example is failures. Kubernetes is designed around the, f around the idea that you know, if some of the pod fails, it's going to do its best to keep things working. When something fails in a car, you don't want to keep working. If something else in the car, you want to know about it and you want to tell the drivers to take over and you know, tr take over the driving of the car, put the car on the side of the road. You don't want to keep working as best as I can. Eventually, you know, I can't detect pedestrian anymore, but yeah, no, that'll be all right. It's not acceptable in a car. So what do we need? We need something that's deterministic. We need to know what runs, where it runs, when it runs. We need something that is lightweight. We, can't, we have a resource constraints environment. We want something that is fast. Your user expectation, when you're driving your car, you want things to work, you want things to start, you don't want to wait for things to, to be available. And you know, it's, it's a small bullet point here, but it's actually one of the core elements of what we are looking into, is the functional safety, FUSA. 
the functional safety certification is basically certifying that your code is doing what you claim that it is doing. That if I ask for it to write a, f a certain content in a file, it's going to write that content in a file. And the more complex the system here is, you know, the more harder the functional safety certification process is going to be because you're going to have to go through every function that are used in your code base and ensure that they are doing exactly what you say they are doing. So to answer this, all of this problematic, we've worked on something called Hirto, and I'll let Michael introduce it to you. <coughs> Thanks, Pierre. So yeah, as you already mentioned, uh, Hirto is our answer to it, and the basic idea behind it is to use systemd to control local services um, on one machine, um, but adding a thin layer on top of it, we are able to uh, manage those units remotely. Uh, it's important to note here that we don't want to manage any state or so. We are just the facilitator of this uh, management. Um, and our approach here is to build a setup or a system that consists of um, two components, basically. The controlling uh, component uh, we call Hirte. That one is running on the main machine. And this one is controlling, of course, then all the connected agents. Um, so the Hirte agent is then running on each managed node uh, and it gets basically the commands from Hirte and forwards them to systemd. So we are able to remotely start, stop, well, control units on remote machines. Um, we decided to go here and implement this with C, um, considering those constraints to be as fast and lightweight as possible and hopefully in the future to FUSA certify it. Um, as the IPC mechanism, we chose DBUS. Uh, well, since it was already used in system D, and if you're wondering now how this is exactly being set up in Hirte, um, well, I'm going to show you. Uh, so Hirte is uh, running on the main node, which you see here on the left. It reads on startup a configuration file where we can specify, of course, all kinds of settings. For example, the port that it is listening for new connections. Um, it then goes ahead, connects itself to the local system bus, um, and provides a public API to it. So that other external applications, for example, like a state manager, um, could use those, this API to well, <coughs> control the whole system. Uh, we already implemented something like uh, here to CTL, which is mm, similar to system CTL from system D, but for a multi-node use case. Um, and on the other side, we have the managed node um, where a here to agent is running. Again, reading some configuration, for example, where we have settings like uh, the IP address of the main node. And the agent connects itself to the local uh, system D bus uh, via Unix domain socket. Um, and by this, we are already able in the agent to control services uh, on the managed node. Um, but the agent then goes ahead and wants to connect itself to Hirte um, based on the settings that we specified. Uh, Namely, it uh, issues a, a connection request over TCP IP, um, and Hirte itself responds by creating a peer-to-peer -peer dbus. Um, this peer-to-peer -peer dbus is used exclusively between Hirte and the respective agent. Uh, more on that later. Um, in addition, Hirte does a lookup. Um, when the agent uh, registers, it does a lookup and checks if it can find, for example, the, the, uh, the node, uh, the node name. And if it can't find the node name, it rejects the whole connection request. If it can't find it, uh, if it can find it, then it uh, accepts the connection. Um, with that, we are already able to control uh, those units on remote nodes. And of course, we can scale up so from one to n nodes, which we all specify um, upfront in what those, this configuration file. And as you can see here on the left side, on the main node, uh, we can of course run the Hirte agent alongside Hirte 
with basically the same mechanism, of course. Um, one uh, question that might <coughs> already uh, arise is how do we deal with uh, cross node dependencies? Like, um, like in this example here. Um, consider we have this setup. Uh, on the left side, we have a node new uh, foo. On the right side, a node bar. And both are connected to Hirte. And now we want to start the cow service um, on the node foo. Uh, what we don't know yet is that the cow service requires the sheep service to run on the node bar. Um, well, how could we resolve that a kind of dependency? Um, for once, like I said, we could use an external state manager that basically uses the Hirte API, but already knows that the cow uh, service requires the sheep service. So it would first uh, start the sheep service, wait for it to run, and then uh, start the cow service. Uh, what we added, however, was uh, a feature, the so-called proxy feature, to push this dependency resolving to, to systemd, that a developer could, at development time, define, OK, I need uh, the sheep service to run on node bar uh, for the cow service. Um, and it works roughly like this. Uh, you see here on the lower left side that the cow service requires a so-called template unit. Um, this is a unit file that Hirte provides to the developer um, where you can pass in the tuple uh, after the add symbol for node underscore the unit. So you specify the name of the unit that you require and the node that you expect this unit to be run on. Um, in our case, um, we want to have the uh, and that's actually a mistake. <laughs> it should be the, the sheep service uh, here. So it should be like Hirte minus proxy at bar underscore sheep service. Um, please substitute, uh, substitute that. Um, which this template unit then uh, takes and passes it to a small binary, the Hirte proxy, which in turn um, separates those two input parameters and does an API call to the Hirte agent. Uh, it's important to note that this API call is blocking, so the proxy waits for the whole flow, so um, it can distinguish between a successful or a failed set setup. And therefore, this can reflect then, of course, in the cow service. Um, the agent forwards that request to Hirte. Um, Hirte knows now uh, on which node to run which unit, so it creates a start request on the node bar in our example, and um, it wants to start another template unit. We don't want to start it directly because then we cannot, uh, because then we uh, kind of limit the ability of the developer. By using a template uh, in between, a template unit in between, um, the developer has all the freedom to specify and define the sheep service however he wants it to run. Um, this template unit, again, then has a very weak dependency on the requested unit, meaning if it's not already running, we will start it. But if it's already starting uh, started, then we don't care. Nothing happens, basically. Um, Important to note, however, is that Hirte will keep track of all the references um, on the node uh, unit uh, tuple. So we know basically um, when, well, how many references there are. And with this setup, we can already resolve this dependency um, just by using already existing system D uh, features. And of course, we can do so by on development time, so to say. Um, yeah. After this, uh, uh, I, and now I have a few examples that I can uh, show you, which I pre-recorded. Um, uh, first of all, for these examples, I used this setup. I started a Raspberry Pi and had an Hirte agent running on it. 
Uh, and I also run a Hirte agent on my laptop, connecting both to Hirte, which was also running on my laptop. Um, I was interacting with the system by using our pre um, uh, built Hirte CTL. And well, the first thing that comes to mind is listing all the units that are on th those nodes. So in this example, I queried for all nodes uh, the, the units that are running or not running. And uh, I filtered them based on their name. Uh, in this spe uh, specific case, I wanted to have all units with the name that contained a bus in it. Um, so we see, for example, the bus service and bus socket on the laptop, which is, are in an active state and are running. Uh, but we also see, for example, some devices that are plugged. Um, we can also start and stop system D units. Um, in this case, I first uh, filtered, of course, for the specific cow service that I wanted to start. Uh, and we see that is currently in an inactive state and dead. Um, then I started the, uh, the cow service with here to CTL start uh, on the pi cow.service. And after querying it again, we see it's active and running. Again, stopping, same, uh, same procedures uh, uh, always. Stopping it, here to CTL, stop pi, cow.service, listing again, and it's inactive and dead again. Um, when starting this, uh, this cow service, I created beforehand a monitor. So you can imagine those start and stop operations always involve some state changes internally on system D side. So what if we want to, to, to get notified on certain changes? We can set up a monitor with, for example, here the CTL monitor, and I wanted to get all units on the Pi. Uh, and this cut example, because otherwise it got too large, uh, just shows the state changes between uh, the states of the cow service. So you see in the... Uh, the second one, you, you see that it currently had an inactive state, then it changed to activating, and finally it reached an active state. And of course, I could now probably do some different operations if I need to. Mm. And the last example is, is kind of similar, um, which is here to CTL monitor node uh, minus connection. So as the name, basically suggests we can also monitor the state of the nodes. Um, in this example, you see that the laptop and the Pi were online. Then I went ahead on the agent, uh, uh, on, on, on the Raspberry Pi, stopped the agent, and this immediately got reflected uh, on this monitor, so the Pi was stated as offline, um, which is especially useful if I want to uh, health monitor my system and do some, well, operations or have, have some fallbacks based on it. Um, yeah, and that's already it. Some, some questions, yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I don't really understand what, what does so different from system D. Mm -hmm. Why not just extend system D? So system D already has the mechanism to do remote connection, but one of the System D already has a built-in mechanism to do remote connection, mm -hmm. but that remote connection relies on SSH. Uh, SSH is not something we want to be running in the car because SSH cannot be, can hardly be limited in this scope. So you have a, it's a full, it gives you a full se shell section, which means if someone plays around in the car and gets a shell access to one of the compute units, it's not actually something we want. And by, by using the e agent and the control, we are actually able to expose in one port only the uh, you know the management to, to control services. <coughs> you won't be able to install a rootkit uh, by you know by this because you can only control system with services. Um, the other problems, though, so that's part one. The the other question is uh, doing this in system D itself is something that we've been thinking about. We would love to, to be able to have it in system proper, but there was a timing perspective. Uh, being able to work with the system D community to to polish it and make it to up to the system D standards. Uh, would probably have taken more time than we were uh, than we have available to, to get this project in a safe way it's usable. Uh, so I would still love to do to see that happening, but I it's 
we also needed to, you know, figuring out is this what we wanted. Uh, you know, we started with proof of concept. We talked with the with the car manufacturer that we're involved with. Does that satisfy your solution? Do you see things that are missing? Uh, this presentation is still something about us trying to figure out: uh, Are there things missing? Are we missing something in the picture here? Are we? Did we forget something? Did we? There are always more brains in two heads than in one. So there is always a capability that we've that we always seen something. And if we were to implement that in System D, then we would not have the flexibility about potentially, you know, changing our approach if we needed it to. So that would be my, my questions. We needed to validate our our approach. Uh, we cannot use SSH, and doing it in System D proper would be ideal, uh, but we're not there yet. question is about leveraging system D uh, for dependency resolution and that's exactly what we want to do. That's why we've implemented the proxy service because we don't want to have to deal with figuring out the order, what can I start in parallel, what needs to be sequential and system D already has all of the logic and is built for that. So we actually want to leverage as much of system D as we can and we try to, to complement it rather than we implement it. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to see if I understood, if I understood all the questions. <laughs> so basically your question is uh, if we already have a project where we uh, applied uh, HIRTE or um that I presented earlier and figure that despite a lot of people being asked, be asking us, I want, we want to run Kubernetes in the cars, uh, we conclude that Kubernetes is a great tool, but not to run in the specific environment that the car is. Mm. Because it's complex, because it's, as, uh, it's heavyweight, because the complexity is going to make the functional safety analysis uh, practically impossible, uh, because it's, it has the eventual consistency that this is built around. Mm -hmm. So all of these make it like, yeah, it's, it's not suitable for the in-car part. Yeah. And
one of the thing that, uh, and I think it's going to have to be the last question because we're out of time. One of the things that uh, Kubernetes does is that it, it's very hard to ask to impose Kubernetes run certain payloads on certain systems. And in the automotive world, you need to be able to mm. test the entirety of your system in bench, in silico, in bench before you actually start in the car so that you cover all of your bases when it comes with either. I have a critical system that I, I need to ensure that this critical system always have enough resources. And then the question of the dynamism of, I want this container to run wherever there are resources is actually something that is being considered, but we don't have an answer, we don't have a proper answer for it yet because we still need to ensure that, you know, adding, adding an extra container, adding an extra container on a specific system is not going to interfere with uh, critical critical systems that are already running in there. So there is, the environment, the in-vehicle environment is a lot, can be a lot more static than yeah. what Kubernetes is used to deal with. And that's, it, they are basically built really for different worlds. And there is, it's going to be hard to make Kubernetes work for, uh, for alternative use case. But I think we're going to have to stop in here because it's uh, out of time in the next week. Yeah. We can, we can finish outside there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>